Hi, um, my name is Sonia Meyer. I'm the treasurer of our local chapter. Um, welcome to our presentation. Um, so like Darren mentioned in the video went over, we have a national speleological society, which is the over arching um, caving organization for the United States. And then within that, there are grottos, um, which are your local chapters, and we're the San Francisco Bay chapter. Um, obviously, the Bay Area is a big area. So there's another grotto called Diablo Grotto, and their domain is kind of East Bay, while we're kind of San Francisco, South Bay, and Santa Cruz. Um, but obviously, there's a ton of overlap. Um, both grottos are great. So wherever, and you know, with virtual meetings, you can kind of attend wherever. I'm also on the board of directors for the National Speleological Society. Um, Carly, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, yeah, I'm Carly. Um, I am the chair of the San Francisco Bay chapter. Um, I've been um, caving uh, for about four years. I grew up in the Bay Area. Um, but then uh, went to Southern California for college, which is where I started um, to really go caving. Um, and you know, when I moved back here for work, um, I also I knew that I um, wanted to get involved with the community, um, and so I found SFBC, and here I am. Cool. And I'm Booth. I am the vice chair of SFBC. Um, and I'm originally an East Coast caver, so I was born in Pittsburgh, went to school in Boston. So I was with um, some grottos in the Boston area. So I know lots about Northeast caves and moved to the Bay Area a little over a year ago. Thanks. Um, I forgot to introduce myself a little bit. I started caving in England when I was studying abroad in college. And then when I came back to the US a few years later, I actually just Googled caving and then I found the NSS and I found my grotto in Virginia. So I started caving in Virginia and West Virginia. And then when I moved to California, I continued to do it. Okay, next please. <clears throat> so first of all, um, and feel free to jot this in the chat. How many of you have been caving before? What kind of caving was it? Was it a commercial cavern guided wild cave? Um, and how would you describe your experience? If anyone wants to um, speak up, I, I actually don't know if you have that ability, but um, you can try if you'd like. I've just allowed people to unmute themselves as well. And, and I'll just jump in and say that I've done some a little bit of caving at um, a national park like Caves National Park, and it was amazing as well as walking in some massive caves and other parts. Nice. Let's see. Oh, Casey has been to some caves in Santa Cruz. I'm betting uh, you've been to IXL. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Okay. All right, well, let's uh, go to the next slide. Um, so, let's see, amateur exploration, very nice, lava river, okay, cool, so there is a wide variety of caves that you guys have been to, that's great. Um, this is the NSS motto, and it really amplifies the leave no trace principle, take nothing but pictures, leave nothing but footprints, and kill nothing but time. Um, throughout our presentation, I hope we can convey the message to you of cave conservation. Um, and this was mentioned in the video, I'm not sure if everyone caught it, but caves are a really delicate environment. Um, it, it takes thousands and thousands of years for the environment to form, and there's no, there's depending on the cave, there may not be wind, water, or things that will wash away our human impact as there is above ground. Um, so cave conservation is really important. And for that reason, um, sometimes there's a level of secrecy around caving because um, some people think one of the ways to protect caves is to keep them secret. Um, SFBC, however, prefers the education approach. We wanna be inclusive and welcoming and teach people um, about good cave ethics. Okay, next. Okay, so what is caving? Um, simply put, it's the exploration of caves for sport or project. Um, sport caving or recreational caving is just 
caving for fun. Um, there's a lot of reasons uh, we do it and I'll go over that in a bit. Um, I do wanna just touch on project caving, which typically tends to be more advanced. Um, sport caving is like the gateway to project caving, but if you get into it, some of the things that you can do are exploration and mapping, conservation and scientific research. Next. Um, so is caving dangerous? <laughs> Um, so, uh, either unmute yourself or jot in the chat, what do you think are some of the dangers of caving? Um, and I do want to say, you know, caving has risks, um, but we can mitigate them with education and appropriate gear. Getting stuck in small places or also claustrophobia. Yep, getting lost and then getting cold. That's exactly right. Getting bitten by a bat. Um, I would say that's not too much of a hazard. <laughs> Lack of oxygen, yes. And that can be an issue in some of our local California caves as well. Mm -hmm. Unsafe air, yep. Thank you guys. Okay, so next. Oh. Um, so these are some of the most common um, issues that you could have in a cave, um, and a lot of them are tied together. So light source fails, it kind of ties into getting lost, right? You, you can't go anywhere, you're stuck. Um, and then that can lead to hypothermia if you can't get out. Um, falling if you slip um, can also lead to you getting stuck and hypothermia. Um, hypothermia is a big deal, by the way. <laughs> um, head bumps, um, exhaustion, dehydration, and then just plain old being stupid. Um, so let's talk about the ways that we can remedy each of these. Next. Um, okay, sorry about the animations here. <laughs> um, so if your light source fails, one of the things we say is each caver should have three sources of light. So if you're caving with your buddy um, or your family, um, each person should have three sources of light. Um, so that would be a total of like 12 amongst four people. Getting lost, um, we really encourage you to cave with an experienced trip leader by contacting the grotto. Um, this is less of an issue in California because the caves tend to be smaller, um, but it's generally just a good practice to cave with an experienced trip leader. They can can tell you about some hazards. Like I mentioned, some caves do have bad air in California. Um, so it's important to um, make note of that. Okay, um, falling. Uh, we encourage you to maintain three points of contact and wear good shoes. Um, head bumps, always wear a helmet. I can't tell you the number of times I've uh, had a helmet check. Um, hypothermia is a really big issue. Um, caves are the average temperature of the local area for the entire year. Um, so yeah, someone just messaged me um, if rocks can fall on people. It does happen. It's pretty rare. It's mostly um, you just not realizing that there's a rock above you and you stand up too quickly. Um, just it's more that kind of thing when it comes to wearing a helmet. Um, or sometimes my back, <laughs> I'll be crawling and I think I'm like clear of the crawlway and I stand up and I get like stabbed in the back. It's pretty painful. Um, so hypothermia, wear appropriate la layers, uh, exhaustion and dehydration. You wanna carry appropriate food and water for your trip. And then we really encourage you to join a grotto and educate yourself. Um, you'll learn a ton from the grotto, from the trip leaders about how to cave safely. Um, as well as the specific hazards and how to cave um, softly as well. Next, please. Oh, someone asked, what is the minimum group size? And we do encourage a minimum of four people for a caving trip. Okay, so I'm not gonna touch too much on vertical caving except for the fact that it exists. Um, vertical caving is, as you can see, you wear special gear so that you can go up and down pits or drop or any vertical hazards. Um, we do have monthly vertical practices with the grottos. So if you check out our website, you can attend the vertical practices and we'll teach you. This photo on the right is from Pinnacles National Park where um, 
before COVID, we tried to do an annual practice there, which was super fun. Um, but I just want to mention that there's a whole set of other um, hazards related to vertical caving, and we're not going to touch on it during this presentation. Next, please. Okay, so we like to joke that caving is type two fun. Um, type one fun is fun in the moment, type two is fun afterwards, and type three fun is not fun. Um, you know, caving is definitely fun. It can be type one fun, but it can also be type two. And the reason is um, the environment can be harsh. And if you're not adequately prepared, um, it can suck, right? Caves are cold. If you're not wearing enough layers, that can be pretty miserable. You can get hypothermia, which is super dangerous um, and just really unpleasant as well. Um, caves can be wet muddy. Um, they can be really physically challenging. And if you're not prepared or if you didn't bring enough food, you're running out of calories, that's really unpleasant. Um, they can be claustrophobic. They can be scary, um, which is similar to claustrophobia, but sometimes you're like climbing along a ledge and people get afraid of exposure. Um, so yeah, if you're not prepared for some of these things, it can be pretty miserable. So I just say this to say that caving is fun and it does have risks um, and it is challenging, but if you're prepared, um, you can mitigate them and it's, it's a really good experience. Next. So why do we do it? Uh, masochism, we like to suffer. <laughs> just kidding. Um, Personally, for me, it's the physical challenge. I really enjoy the exercise. I enjoy the body puzzle. I always think of caves as like a 3D puzzle that I have to fit my body through. Um, so I personally love that part. Um, it's hot outside. You know, these California summer days can get kind of unpleasant. So it's nice to go underground. Um, the thrill of exploration being um, maybe you're not the first person to ever be there, but it's the first time you've been there. And that's pretty fun to explore a new cave. Um, cave life is pretty interesting. There's all kinds of cool little critters. Um, you might go in to collect cave samples or to collect samples for science. And finally, the pretties. A lot of people really enjoy looking at cave formations and taking pictures of them and just kind of marveling at how this delicate, beautiful, feature took thousands and thousands and thousands of years to form. It's pretty incredible. Okay, next. All right, so I'll pass it over. Um, I think Boo was going to do speleothems. I'll talk about speleothems. Oh, probably. Go ahead. Yes, no worries. Um, so here are, um, I'll run you through some of the pretties that you might encounter when in a cave. Um, all of these are very um, delicate. So whenever we see pretties in a cave, we make sure not to touch it. Um, we can take photos, you know, take nothing but pictures um, on all that. Popcorn is one of the most common um, pretties in the cave. Um, it's this like pretty rough texture along the walls um, and sometimes the floor. Um, and it, it looks like popcorn kernels um, once they've been popped, uh, but it's made of rock. So it's kind of cool. Um, next. Cave pearls is one of my personal favorites. Um, here are some cave pearls in four different stages of formation. They're kind of formed like oysters, um, pearls, where there's like this grain of rock. And then um, over time, it uh, gets layers of calcite um, around it and then gets larger and larger um, as the water drips in. Um, it's worth noting that most of these caves are in limestone um, and sometimes meta limestone is metamorphosed into marble. Um, and so both of those rocks have a lot of calcium carbonate in them. And so when the water seeps through, it will dissolve some of the calcium carbonate into carbonate ions. Um, when it reaches an airspace, the, um, the, those minerals will precipitate out. Um, and this is just some of the science, uh, precipitate out and form many of these formations. Um, so most of, most of these are all the same mineral and I'll note when they're not. Um, one other thing that we can, for can form are rimstone dams. Um, this is usually, there's usually a bunch of crystals within the um, pools of water within the dam system. Um, and it's usually formed by a small uh, low flow stream kind of trickling down um, and forming the edges of these dams over time. Next. Um, sometimes just the pretty rocks are cool to look at. Um, these are from Lilburn Cave, which is the longest cave in California. Um, 
as I mentioned, um, the, the limestone can get metamorphosed into marble. Um, the marble is really pretty. Um, and uh, sometimes even the like sand formations on the bottom of the pool, pools of water is really pretty as well. Next. Flowstone um, is another one that you've probably seen if you've been in any show cave. Um, it's when some water comes out of the side or the, the ceiling um, and kind of drips down and you kind of get these like draperies. Um, they kind of look like a waterfall kind of frozen in time. Next. Um, sometimes I mentioned that um, these are often out of limestone. Um, at some point, fossils started become, being in limestone. You can actually find caves that are older than fossils, but most of the uh, caves in California are have fossils or, or like are formed from the time when fossils were a thing. Um, fossils, um, yeah, you can find fossils like this is a trilobite um, in the caves as well. Um, another really pretty formation is cave bacon. So this is formed um, by really like a, kind of usually in a crack in the ceiling um, and then layers of water get deposited over time. And these take like millennia to um, form. And uh, so you can kind of see how the minerals have changed over time uh, in what gets deposited. Um, these are often really, cave bacon is usually really thin. Um, and so it's really, it, it, you can get really pretty pictures when you light it from behind because some of the light comes through. Um, Box work is not calcium carbonate. It is um, made of mostly iron um, and it's really delicate sheets um, of this stuff. Uh, and it is also formed um, in kind of the cracks between the rock. Next. Soda straws is um, possibly one of the most delicate formations in caves. They're all very delicate, don't touch, but um, soda straws are like a centimeter wide and like, you know, uh, feet long. So these things um, are basically a dripsicle um, that has been deposited over time. Eventually they will, um, the, what determines whether it's a soda straw or um, the next formation, which is a um, uh, stalactite, um, is kind of the chemistry um, and the rate of uh, drippage. Um, and so the so stalactites are kind of the like larger soda straws. Um, you might have all heard of stalactites um, also in the terms of like stalactites and stalagmites. Um, stalagmites are also a thing, but not shown here. Um, next, gypsum flowers. Uh, gypsum is another mineral um, and it grows in all sorts of fun directions. And so you can get some really um, pretty formations from the gypsum um, forms that forms in caves. Next. And halectites are kind of soda straws that have grown in every different direction. There's a couple of different uh, theories um, as to the origins of halectites. Some think it's um, caused by the way that the wind blows in caves. Um, some thinks that there is some sort of bacterial organism that is kind of influencing the direction that these um, essentially small so soda straws grow in. Um, Sometimes um, like the cave also shifts its direction due to geologic events. Um, They're <laughs> almost always uh, really pretty. Um, so yeah, I think that's all. Maybe there's one more formation. Yeah, those are some of the more common um, formations that you'll find in caves. I'll uh, hit, uh, hand it over to Boof to talk about the types of caves. Thanks, Carly. So cave's a very general term, and when you pop into a hole in the ground, you'll find all sorts of caves. Um, one of the big types of caves are the big and the wet caves. Um, you won't so much find huge caves around here, especially if you go to the southeast part of the United States, like West Virginia, Tennessee, over there, you'll find some really big caves. And um, some of these caves can also have a lot of water. Um, I bet a lot of you are familiar with like the Thailand cave rescue that happened, um, I guess a couple years ago now, um, where they actually had to dive, like use uh, cave diving to rescue um, the kids trapped in the cave. And um, 
SFBC specifically, we don't do a whole lot of cave diving, um, but it is a division of the NSS, so you will hear that every once in a while. It's a very specified form of um, caving, but I just wanted to acknowledge that it does exist, and um, some people will actually dive in these large parts, like large underground lakes, but also really small tight passages with like specialized diving equipment. Um, it's pretty different than like open water diving you'll find in the ocean. Another kind of cave is vertical. Uh, Sonia mentioned earlier that um, it's more of a, another kind of specialized version of caving. Um, our grotto does do a lot of vertical caving because um, especially around here, you will find a lot of areas of caves that you can only access using ropes and harnesses and um, more like very specific equipment. Um, it, it was also mentioned that we do have monthly vertical practices. So if this is something that interests you, um, you can definitely acquire these skills. And it's really cool that um, there are horizontal caves where you don't need any ropes to get around. But um, you never know what you're going to find using ropes at the very bottom of a deep pit in a cave. Um, so that side of exploration can be very cool. Uh, caves also come in the tight variety. Um, there are a lot of California caves that are very small and tight. You'll have some where there are long, really tight passages, kind of like on the picture on the right, where you have to squirm your way through really long passages. Um, there are also pinches where it's kind of large and then gets really tight and then a little larger again. Like the picture on the left is um, a cave, Morris Cave in Vermont, uh, where this particular squeeze um, is kind of fun when you get there. You actually have to, there's a pump that you have to actually pump the water out of like a shallow uh, pinch to be able to squeeze your body through. So you like pump out all the water and then you go through um, so you can get to the other side because over a long time, this water collects um, in this area right here. Um, so this is one of the parts of physical challenges that can be really fun to see what kind of positions you can con contort your body into. Another kind of cave that is often overlapped on other kinds of caves is muddy. Um, very often, if you go into a cave with lots of bright colored clothing and a cool, pretty red bag, um, everything will just come out brown. Um, cave mud has a very interesting kind of sticky consistency that will not escape you if you go underground and you'll just you'll just come out completely brown. Um, it, it can also be really fun. There's a cave in West Virginia called Sharps Cave where there's um, it's called like the, the mud room where there are from decades old, um, they're just sculptures that people have made out of clay. And this clay is like, it's such a consistency that you can like mold stuff out of it. And it'll just stay there. So like things from years and years ago, you'll see like, like human size sculptures that people have made out of mud. So it, it can be kind of fun, even if it's all over the place when you come out. Um, alpine caves are more up north where it gets really cold. Um, you won't so much find those around here, maybe if you go really far north, but um, those are the kind, there'll be lots of snow outside the entrance and even colder temperatures than you'd usually find inside a cave. Um, they're also dry caves, so on the opposite side of cave diving and getting really wet, needing a wetsuit, um, you'll find dry caves. This this is Bo Norman, also in West Virginia. And when you walk through this cave, like every step you take, there's just like a small cloud of dust that comes up from the ground because it's just so dry in there. Um, especially along the coast here, you'll find like sea caves that'll be carved out from, from the ocean. They can be pretty picturesque. Um, Talus caves are a kind of cave where um, instead of the cave forming, initially underground this is more when you have like a canyon um, or like a ravine where rocks will fall on top of it and then trap it and trap it underground and then that'll end up becoming a cave because these rocks came and kind of enclosed it in the earth. Um, there are also ice caves. Uh, so glacier caves are 
where it's actually like the whole cave is in ice and it's like out of a glacier ice caves um the whole thing might not be made out of ice but there's like um, lots of ice inside. Um, again, you won't so much find these around here, but if you go way up north, um, they can be very pretty. And lava caves. So you will find these in California, quite a few of them. Um, they're lava tubes. They tend to be very open, kind of cylindrical, very hard to get lost in because they're formed when the lava flows after, like from a volcanic eruption. Um, this can happen by the lava kind of burrowing under the ground. And so these lava tubes are actually where the lava um, from the eruption flowed outwards. And it can also form above ground um, as the lava kind of um, solidifies. It'll it can end up making like a kind of tube above ground, um, which ends up becoming the lava tube. Um, but they can be pretty interesting. They have um, interesting geology because you have the volcanic rock. Um, and if you're worried about getting lost, uh, this is the kind of cave for you because they tend to be pretty straightforward. And I'll hand it back to Carly, who's going to tell you about California caves. Yeah, so I wanted to um, walk you through some of the caves that you might encounter um, either in the course of exploring uh, caves in California or um, participating in some grotto trips. So one of the um, common uh, caves in the area is Clay Cave. This is a fairly small beginner friendly cave in the area. Um, it's a, um, yeah, it's up uh, north of the Golden Gate, um, but um, it's a nice day trip from the Bay Area. Next, uh, Clear Cave um, is a pretty small cave in Santa Cruz area. Um, it's got some interesting formations, um, but it's not particularly big. Still fun to go to. Uh, next. IXL is the one that you might have heard of. Um, it's the big one on the UC Santa Cruz campus. Um, it's these formations um, have seen some use, um, seen a lot of um, vandalism. You can see where some of those uh, formations have been broken off. Um, and, uh, you know, mud kind of just covers the cave. Um, not particularly big in uh, is mostly uh, like how long it takes to explore the extent of the cave so not particularly big would be like an hour you could see all of the cave um and um some of the larger caves are like well like for ixl for example is like a thousand feet feet of passage um i think um uh, of map passage anyway um and so IXL is still only um, if you know the route and you um, are super skilled at it, um, it's about 20 minutes from the back to the um, exit. But um, I've seen people take an hour and a half to do that. Um, so it, uh, yeah, also the um, like height, it, it also influences the size of the cave. Anyway, um, lava beds, as Booth mentioned, um, is one of the um, cave types of caves that you'll find in California. Um, Lava Beds National Monument, which Darren um, linked in the chat, um, is like the lava beds, lava area, lava tubes. Um, lava um, tubes are usually large and like walking, um, like subway passage size, um, just because that's the size that um, that's the amount of lava that's needed to maintain a tube. Um, yeah. They often tend to have skylights and such. Finished River um, is another cave that is um, in close-ish to the Bay Area. Um, it's got a lot of um, delicate, um, delicate formations, a lot of really pretty stuff. Um, and there is a management plan um, in, in place. And um, we, um, we run a couple of trips a year uh, to Finished River we being the like the larger group of gratis. Um, Pinnacles is one that you can just go visit on your own. Um, Balconies Cave is a talus cave. Um, I think the other cave in that area um, is also um, worth worth taking a look at. Um, it is, um, yeah, talus caves are a lot of fun to climb around in and see like 
there might be 17 different ways to get from point A to point B um, in a talus cave. And, and that's one of the reasons that I find them so fun. Next. Um, someone was asking about bad air um, and low oxygen levels. Rock pile is an area which we've noticed um, uh, seasonally has uh, a lack of, uh, has some amount of bad air. Um, there's some theories as to why there's like a research paper that's been done on it. Um, there's uh, some amount of plant matter that, that falls in and um, decomposes. And then depending on the temperatures, um, sometimes the air can't get trapped down there and can't get out. So when, this is one of the place that we, places that we always test the air when we go. Um, it's just a field with a bunch of rocks in it. Um, some of the rocks have entrances to caves. Um, this area is also very vertical. So, uh, and, and the caves are generally pretty tight. Um, but it is a good place to go if you are looking um, to, if you've got, got your vertical skills or just built them um, and are looking to explore more. Um, and it's typically better to go to the rock pile in the winter. So great if you'd like to, so yeah, join, join and uh, work on your vertical and go there. Um, Santa Claus Cave is one on um, a uh, newly acquired property for the Western Cave Conservancy. Um, the Western Cave Conservancy is one of the organizations that um, helps with interfacing with landowners, providing management plans, um, and um, pro providing management plans um, and acquiring caves. Um, this is one on one of the properties that they recently um, purchased. Uh, yeah, volcano. Yeah, volcano is another. Uh, I think that's the term for the general area. Um, some of the caves are vertical. Some of the caves are horizontal. Um, as you can, you can see, like a lot of popcorn on the walls. That's pretty common for caves in this area. Next, Millerton is um, one of my favorite caves because I also enjoy the sport of canyoneering. Um, and so Millerton has a lot of water and a lot of slick granite. Um, it's actually formed just entirely from water, carving out this granite stuff. Um, and so um, it's a completely different type of feeling of cave. Um, there's a lot of, like you wear a wetsuit, um, it's a lot of water, um, you can, you know, fall in puddles that are like neck deep. Um, there's a lot of interesting challenges to Millerton. Um, this is outside of Fresno. Um, a lot of interesting challenges to Millerton that I uh, enjoy. Thanks, Darren. Um, it, and then Mineral King um, is a part of Sequoia National Park, um, and there's a lot of caves um, in the Mineral King area. Um, and there's some more work that's been done to connect the hydrological sources in the area to the caves. Um, in, of note in the Mineral King photo, um, the uh, white stuff is actually not snow. Uh, although these caves are in an area where it does snow um, in the winter, but this um, is actually rock. The rock is just white because it's marble. Um, next. Rippled is one of our favorite caves um, to run beginner trips to because um, it's shaped like a hand, like there's a, an entrance and then the passages kind of all go out from there. Um, and so you're not, never very far from the ex exit. So it's really easy to go in for like an hour, come back out, eat a snack, assess how everyone's doing, figure out what we wanna do next. Um, and so that's why we like it. Um, it's also a pretty horizontal cave. Wilburn is, as I mentioned, the longest cave in California. Um, it does has a lot of um, a lot of really interesting scientific projects going on. Um, it is one of the vertical and advanced and really cold caves, um, but it is something to, uh, I guess, work your way up to, um, and it's really pretty. Um, Church is um, another cave in the Sequoia Kings area. And um, it has some really tall rooms. Um, maybe that's why it's called church. I don't particularly know. Um, this is an example of the back backpack that I'm wearing is uh, red. It's like bright red, but it at this by this point in the cave, it's turned pretty brown. Um, next, uh, Crystal sixty seven um, is another cave that is notable for. Um, having the largest room um, by volume in California. Um, 
it's got the mountain room, which is just kind of the side of a mountain is hollow. Um, this is another cave that is vertical. Um, Empire Cave is um, another cave near IXL. Um, it sometimes has bad air, we've noticed lately. Um, so if you do choose to explore it, um, proceed with caution. Um, if you start to feel faint or lightheaded, um, then just return back the way you've gone. Um, Great. So, there, so there's a couple of caves coming up here, which are um, also a beginner caves in the um, gold country area, more or less. Um, they've got some pretty cool formations. Sometimes we run photo trips there. Um, it's kind of um, nice to get some beginner caving in that with uh, stuff that's actually pretty. <laughs> so this is Grapevine, uh, which is one of the caves in the area. Um, next. Heater is another one. Um, I like this one because it's really sparkly. Um, you can see the formation in the back. Um, it just like, it's, it's sparkling, it's bright white. Um, it's really cool to see kind of formations that have been per preserved so well. Um, and it's just like you go in and you put your, put your headlamp on and, or, or you, you have it on, uh, but you shine your headlamp at it and it just glitters. It's, it's pretty amazing. Next. And Wool Hollow is um, another fun one in the same vicinity as Heater. Um, so this is demonstrating the principle that like, sometimes it's easy to get in a cave, but sometimes it's harder to get out. So they've used some webbing to uh, use as a hand line to um, help the climb out. But it was pretty easy to get in here because you can just kind of push against the walls and kind of slowly step down. It's a little harder to get out. Um, so whenever you're exploring a cave or a hole in the ground, um, it's good to know how you're going to get out. Next. Windler is one of the um, ones that the Western Cave Conservancy manages. This has got some of the prettiest decorations that I've ever seen, uh, prettiest formations that I've ever seen um, in California. Um, the, here are some soda straws with like more crystals growing off of the soda straws. It's just mind blowing what you can see um, in this cave. Um, and then I also like to mention Bigfoot because it is the deepest cave in California and it has the potential to be the longest. We are doing some active work in this area and um, it, yeah, uh, there's a lot to be mapped and connected and everything, um, but hydrologically it could be, could be the longest. Next, cool. I think um, Sonia is gonna talk about white nose. Yeah, so I, um, someone mentioned bats in the comments. Um, so first of all, I want to talk about why we like bats. Um, first of all, they're cute. Um, they're kind of like the uh, mascot for cavers. Um, but more importantly, they're a natural pesticide because they eat bugs. And um, it's estimated that they save agricultural industries like billions of dollars each year. And they um, help pollinate over 700 different plants and foods, um, including avocados, which are my favorite. Um, so bats are really important to our ecosystem, to our economy. Um, they're super cute and it's just nice to, you know, help preserve, um, animal ecosystems. So what's been going on with bats is something called white nose syndrome. Um, it is a fungus called PD. I'm not going to try to pronounce that. Um, but it started in 2006 in New York and it has slowly spread across the U S I believe, um, two years ago, I think it was, had the first case of um, the first detection of PD in California, but not white nose syndrome. Um, so this uh, disease has killed millions of bats and how it works is that um, fungus grows on the nose. So you can see in the image, they have white fuzz on their nose. So that's the fungus and it wakes up bats from hibernation and then they die of starvation. So um, bats will reserve fat um, for the winter, right? And they go to sleep. Um, when this wakes them up, one, it burns all of their fat reserves and two, they go fly out into the cold and there's no bugs, there's nothing for them to eat. So they die. Um, what can we do about it? We can decontaminate our gear. Um, there's three methods for decontamination. One is heat, um, so hot water. Uh, one is sunlight and the other is just Lysol, so something that will kill fungus. Um, personally, I do all three when I'm 
decontaminating my gear just because I want to be super thorough. Um, uh, but it's good practice to decontaminate your gear between every cave that you go to, um, but definitely between every state. Um, California has, like I mentioned, detected the fungus, but it has no cases of white nose. And um, I don't, what, what people are saying is that it's unlikely to um, affect the bats here just because of their natural um, hibernate. We, they don't really hibernate because it's warmer and they don't roost together like they do on the East Coast. Um, so we're very hopeful that we will not have white nose here, um, but we should still do everything that we can to prevent the spread, um, to prevent further spread. Next. Yeah, so caving can be very exciting and lots of fun. And in order to keep it that way, there are lots of things that you can do and you really should do um, to keep everyone safe and happy. Uh, the first of which is never cave alone. So we recommend at a very minimum three people, four is even way better, at least four people when you go caving, um, never go alone. Um, you should always, each of you should always have at least three sources of light. Um, at least two of those should be able to go on your head so you have your hands free um, for crawling and climbing and things. Um, some caves require permission, like a permit to get into. You should always research and make sure you're doing everything you need to to be allowed into the cave you're going inside. Um, if you violate the rules that the landowner has put in place, this could jeopardize future cavers being able to go into the cave. Uh, you should never vandalize a cave. So some of you have mentioned that you've been to IXL or it's also known as Hellhole in Santa Cruz. Um, you don't want to do what people have done there and like put spray paint and all kinds of stuff all over the cave. That's not good for the cave environment. It's not nice for future cavers to look at. Um, you can actually get prosecuted for this um, from the Federal Cave Resources Protection Act of 1988. So it actually is a federal law not to um, vandalize a cave. Make sure you're taking care of yourself when you're in a cave. You always need enough food and water. Um, you always don't rely on your best friend. Oh, they'll bring enough water for me too. No, you all should, you should be prepared for yourself, have everything you need, layers. Um, you should really be self-sufficient so that if anything goes wrong amongst all of you, you should be able to take care of yourselves. Um, one kind of small thing is um, if you haven't had much experience wearing a headlamp, um, so like a head mounted, light. It was actually very easy to blind each other. Um, if you, if it's pointed right in front of you and you look at your friend's face, you can actually blind them. And um, you want to make sure you're not doing that while you're doing something like climbing or anything. Um, but don't forget to decontaminate your gear. We love bats. Please don't. Um, please don't kill our bats. Um, and one thing that might not jump out um, when you're thinking about going caving is you want to plan ahead for if you're going to need to do your business while you're in there. Um, if it's a long cave, you might need to bring like a bottle. Um, I've heard um, a cave burritos, one term that people will bring like tin foil and bags um, if you're really going to be in there for a long time. Um, it's not nice for the cave environment or anyone else after you. Um, if you're just going to the bathroom um, in the cave, especially not like in a running stream of water. Now, if you don't follow all these guidelines, um, you could end up being needing rescued from a cave. Like if you get, if you didn't bring enough light and all your lights go out, you didn't bring enough food and you start to get hypothermic, or you get lost. Uh, rescues are not fun. Um, for every hour it takes you to go into a cave, it's estimated it takes about four hours for a rescuer to come and get you out of that. Um, so you really don't want to be stuck in a cave for hours and hours, if not days, if you need rescued. And it's just not a fun time for everyone. So take care of yourself, take care of your friends, um, make sure you're caving responsibly. So what do you need to actually bring when you go caving? 
Um, now, this is one of the things that you can definitely get by by not spending a whole lot of money if you just want to try something out. Um, like if you've never been caving before, don't go buying like hundreds of dollars worth of stuff for something you may not end up actually liking. Um, you can certainly borrow some things um, like our grotto will rent out some items and um, if you're going on a trip with a trip like the, your trip leader might also be able to lend you some stuff. So the basics are you always need a helmet. Um, it's really easy to underestimate how often you're going to hit your head in a cave and you'll be very grateful you had a helmet um, for it later. Um, you also want to make sure this is a proper helmet so it needs like a proper suspension system like if a rock falls on your head um, you really want that to be there to protect you. Uh, so you'll need headlamps. They can get very pricey, but if you're, especially if this is a low key trip, um, you don't need to go all out. Uh, rugged clothing is important. Um, some cavers will have like whole cave suits. Um, if you're just trying it out, especially you can just go in like whatever your most rugged old clothing that you just don't care about are. Um, like you can wear really old tennis shoes as long as they still have a really good tread because um, caves can be very slippery. Um, if you have like an old sweatshirt and like, I don't know, really old um, pants that you don't mind getting ripped up. Uh, knee pads are way more important than you might think. You can even just use like gardening knee pads or um, biking knee pads or anything of the sort. Um, you'll probably be crawling an awful lot in caves and rocks can be sharp and it's nice to have a bit of padding there. And also gloves. So gloves are not only for your fingers protection, but it's also for the cave protection. Your fingers have um, oils that aren't good for formations, which you shouldn't be touching anyway, um, but you don't want to get your oils all over the cave. Um, there are some other things you might end up needing, like if you're going into a very wet cave, you might need a wetsuit, so it kind of keeps you warm when you're in the water. Um, if you end up going to a vertical cave, which you would have previous training for, um, anyway, you might need vertical gear, but really this is the basics you need for like a beginner horizontal trip when you're wearing, for what you're wearing. Um, and in your cave pack, so that's, everything you're bringing that's not directly on your body. Um, normal cave packs um, that you'd buy as a cave pack, they tend to be cylindrical for you to be able to um, really nicely put through like a squeeze and they often have drainage holes. So if you're going in water, but really any old backpack that you don't mind getting gripped up is fine. Um, this is where you'd put your extra lights, um, food, water, a trash bag is always good. I actually recommend um, sticking a trash bag inside your helmet because say something goes wrong, and you get separated from your cave pack, you'll always have a helmet on your head and trash bags can be very effective if you're hypothermic and need to warm yourself up. You can kind of wear it as like um, a dress. You just poke a hole in the top and the sides. Um, so it's nice to have that in your helmet if you need it. Um, space blankets are very cheap. You can buy them like on Amazon, probably even Walmart. Um, they're like those foil type of blankets that are really good at heat retention. So if you're getting really cold in a cave, they're great for that. And any kind of um, like self first aid kit with like ibuprofen and any medications. Um, overall, this is generally what you need. Um, if uh, you can borrow some things from your trip leader or a grotto, um, and really you can get away with not spending a whole lot if you're just getting started. Um, yeah. And I think uh, so. Um, yeah, I just wanted to touch on the fact um, that there are a lot of different, very fascinating sciences of caving. Um, we call speleology the just overarching sciences of caving. Um, but within that, you have um, mapping, biology, microbiology, archaeology, paleontology. Um, paleoclimate is pretty cool. You could take like a core of a stalagmite and get paleoclimate data going back thousands of years. Um, which is really fascinating. So 
Yeah, I just wanted to touch that um, beyond the fun aspect, there's also really interesting research. Next. Um, here are some really good books to get started with caving. You can find them on the NSS bookstore. Uh, next. And then these are some children specific books as well that you can check out. Next. Um, so uh, I'll walk you through our website really quickly, but um, the best way is to connect with local cavers. Our grotto is the San Francisco Bay chapter. Here's our website. Um, you can check out other resources like caves.org. Um, Derek Bristol is a caver and YouTuber that has a ton of really good educational videos on every topic that you can imagine. Um, and then the Caving Podcast is a really good podcast that highlights different cavers um, and talks about all kinds of really interesting things. So I'm gonna um, share my screen so you can see our website and just give you a quick walkthrough. Um, so most of the information you need will just be right here on the home page. We used to meet in person in the San Carlos Library, but now we have our meetings online. Um, our email list is here, our trip calendar, and then we have a um, separate email list for new cavers where we only will um, announce beginner friendly trips or things that might be of interest to new cavers, as opposed to the mailing list where you might hear more about um, speleopolitics and uh, more advanced topics, vertical trips and things like that. Um, and then our links up here are pretty straightforward. Um, we have information on White Nose Decon. Um, we have resources specifically if you're new to caving and different kinds of caving, um, how to cave with us, the trip calendar, how to join our, our um, lists. We have a $20 membership fee if you want to join the grotto. And if you do, you get access to the members only section. Um, where we have a trip fund, a Wikipedia of local caves, past newsletters where you can read about caves um, in the area as well as all over, um, past presentations and a joint calendar. So yeah, um, I saw Darren said he would share some of these resources, but you can also click contact here. It'll get to us. Um, we also have a Facebook page as well. So there's a lot of ways uh, that you can contact us. Let's see. Uh, does anyone have any questions? And I would just like to remind you that uh, you are welcome to turn on your audio now to ask questions. You may show up in the recorded video if you do so, but if you don't want to do that, you can also drop questions in the chat and we'll be able to answer those as well. Mm -hmm. Do you have to be slim or average build or height to cave? Um, no, people of all sizes and all heights cave. Um, the fun thing about that is that depending on the cave, you may be at an advantage if you're short um, or something like that. So it really depends on the cave. And or then, a disadvantage, uh, like I am pretty short and I struggle to do some of the moves. And so like, it's really actually advantageous to have a variety of um, sizes and builds on your cave trip because some things that like I might need a hand with something um, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah but you might want to like have somebody to poke their head in a really small hole and see if it goes and if it goes then everyone else will try a little harder yeah and then for being slim like when you're squeezing through a tight squeeze like fat will move right bones don't um, so I would say it might be a negative to be big boned if you're uh, in a tight crawly cave, but fat moves. Um, beginner caves, what are the age ranges? I'd say anyone can cave. I've heard stories of people that start caving after they retire, like from long careers and they're super active and yeah, so any age really. Um, what is the max size for a group you would do? Um, I would say it depends on the cave and the comfort of the trip leader. Um, personally, I probably wouldn't do more than 10. And usually when I'm leading a trip, I'll also want at least one other experienced caver to kind of be the tail. So I would be at the front and then um, someone that I know is experienced would be at the back just to make sure we don't lose anyone. <laughs> Kids make uh, really great cavers. They are generally pretty fearless um, and uh, um, 
will, uh, yeah, as, as long as they have the proper gear, um, which is like a head, they make helmets for kids um, and a headlamp, just kind of set them loose. Um, there are some of the vertical caves. I've seen people with kids as young as like four or five um, teaching them to do vertical things as well. Um, I've, one of my greatest cave trips was with the 12 year old um, and um, family. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Also say SFBC will um, often have like pretty big caving trips, but we'll split up into smaller groups. Um, so like we'll go to Rip Boulder Millerton with a group of like 30 people. And then we'll have um, four like smaller groups within that that'll go to different sections of the cave and kind of leapfrog each other. Not recently though, COVID. <laughs> Carly, do you want to get the COVID one? The COVID? Sure. Yeah. So SFBC um, has some policies around um, how COVID is handled. Um, now that people have been able to get vaccinated and such, we uh, basically our current policies are the trip leader kind of determines um, what what the restrictions are um, and has to communicate that um, when they like announce their trip to the grotto. Um, so this could be anything like limiting the group size to making sure everyone's fully vaccinated. Um, and, um, you know, sometimes it's possible to wear masks in caves, sometimes they're really wet, and so that would be a hazard, um, kind of communicating all of those potential uh, risks to people that are interested. Yeah. There are some also some caves that the landowners are still a little bit hesitant um, to let people into because of COVID, and so we're working with those people um, to ease access to those areas. There is a question, do caves get crowded? Um, unless it's like a very well-known cave, like maybe IXL, I, I don't know if you guys, maybe lots of groups go in there, but um, mostly you'll probably be the only group in a cave. If there are other groups, there's likely room to get around them. Um, that's not, crowding It's not a huge issue when it comes to caving. Mm -hmm. Some caves also have management plans um, that like limit the number of people or groups that can go in any given like week or month or year. Um, mm -hmm. And so we, we try and kind of figure out what the carrying capacity, so to speak, um, of the caves are. And so some of the um, more, um, more delicate caves, like for example, Windler um, has a cap of like 40-ish people a year, um, which is currently um, large enough for uh, cavers um, to be able to go at least once. Um. Um, when is the next SFBC beginner trip? Uh, I don't believe we currently have anything on the calendar. Is that correct? I don't think so, but uh, we certainly could. Um, we have in the, I think in the past month, we've done some things to like mm -hmm. Volcano and um, yeah, we. I'd love to get back to IXL before the end of the year. Yeah, yeah that would be a good one. We hadn't been doing anything in person for a pretty long time. We started doing vertical practices because um, they're outdoors a few months ago. And then um, we've had a few caving trips, but it's, yeah, it's definitely been a little bit slower than usual. Before COVID, we would have at least one trip a month. Yeah, even if there's not a, a trip um, right away on the calendar, I'd highly recommend the vertical practices because they can be a lot of fun and you can meet people from the grotto and it's a good place to network and, oh, you go to this cave, you want to you wanna maybe run a beginner trip there, you can probably convince someone. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Especially you in case like- ask. Yeah. <laughs> people are willing to. <laughs> We oft also often run like cleanup trips to some of the um, caves like IXL. So um, if you're like, hey, like I think I think I've seen some trash in this cave. Let's <laughs> go caving there and also pick up some stuff, what we find. Um, yeah, people really care about conservation, and so you can probably find someone happy to do that. Any other questions? 
Well, thank you everyone for taking the time to listen to us share our passion of caving. <laughs> thank you all so much for uh, sharing that with us, Carly, Lou, and Sonia, and our uh, local SFBC at Grotto. I really appreciate all this information. Uh, we'd love for you all to uh, please let us know what you thought about it and uh, recommend future events at smcl.org slash rate this event. You can see that right down below.